going to jump into the next film here. We got Final Destination. Now, Final Destination, uh, the first film in the franchise, is I obviously think, I mean, I think is obviously the best film in that franchise. I really enjoy this film. Uh, the film stars Devin Sawa, who is an actor that I don't, I mean, I, I think he has good charisma, and I think he has been in a lot of good movies, but he's been in a lot of shitty ones, too. But uh, the ones I have personally seen him in, I've seen him in more good ones than bad ones. I like him in this film, and I also like him in fucking Idle Hands with a co-star in Seth Green. That I just I like that film a lot, too. I think it's funny as fuck. But uh, as far as this film goes, what I really love about this film is that I really feel like this is a really unique film uh, in the horror world because the actual killer in this film is death itself which I just think is a really cool idea. I also love the cameo by Tony Todd. I gotta confess, I'm a fan of Tony Todd, and any film with a cameo in it uh, of him automatically <laughs> makes me give it bonus points. This is a really unique idea of death itself being a killer, and just that alone automatically uh, makes this film rank high up on my favorites list. And just the creative deaths that death itself is able to come up with. You get the idea that death is like really fucking smart to come up with half the shit, that it puts together in here. Maybe death could be MacGyver. I don't know. It seems possible from the shit he comes up with. But what starts out as a really great plot idea for this film uh, kind of becomes cliched and overdone with the sequels, which just get worse and worse. But as far as just the first film goes, this is a really great film. And, what, and I, um, from what I remember back in the day when it came out, I think it came out maybe around the year 2000, maybe 2001. I'm not for sure. Or maybe even 1999. Uh, it's somewhere around that area, I think, or timeline. But uh, it's de I definitely think it was one of the much better films and much more creative films when it came out. I just think it's sad to see that the franchise is kind of like degenerated into let's just see how how cool we can kill people instead of kind of instead of keeping like the creative like plot of this movie or being more creative with the plot of the first movie and amping it up. Instead of just uh, amping up the deaths, uh, the deaths in the films, and not really giving a shit much about the story, um, I think the Saw franchise kind of started to do the same thing too, just to see how like uh, how cool we can make someone uh, like how cool we can make somebody's death look, uh, and it just kind kind of becomes consumed by that later on. The franchise does just like the Saw franchise does, but as far as this film goes right here, uh, I think this is a really creative film, and I really love the idea of this film. And I definitely recommend to any horror fan who wants to try, who wants to see something fresh and new, like, a, and, and, and who wants to see a really cool idea with Death himself as the killer, I definitely recommend that uh, if you want to see, like I've said, if you want to see a really fresh idea, I definitely recommend that you check this film out. Now we're going at it with Hellraiser 2 here. Now Hellraiser 2 is the second best film in the series, in my opinion, after part one. I know a lot of people also feel that way. And also, in my opinion, uh, this is the this is where the Hellraiser franchise uh, pretty much should have stopped, despite the fact I don't hate number three. Part three is where they tried to make Pinhead uh, and Hellraiser, the franchise, more mainstream. Uh, so part three is, I'm kind of half and half on three, but after that, four is just dull, and then after that, the movies just get worse and worse. Uh, despite the fact also that I don't think part five is that bad either. Uh, this right here, though, is just where it just feels like the story reaches its peak. With the characters actually going into hell and everything in this film. And that's what I really like about the film is the characters going into hell. Um, one of the only things that uh, kind of weakens this film is that the character of Kirsty's father from the first film uh, doesn't come back in this film. Uh, I heard that he was supposed to be here. But Andrew Robinson uh, didn't, uh, didn't think they were paying him enough, I believe, to come back. Or weren't going to pay him enough. To be in the film, so he said, "Fuck it," and got the hell out of Dodge. And they had to rewrite the script, and that's what weakens the story a little. Uh, but the movie makes up for it because of uh, like the cool visuals and how creative hell looks, like a giant fucking maze and everything. That's just really neat. And also, I also feel like this film wraps up the Pinhead character. He dies at the end of this, at the end of this film, and I think it, uh, I think it pretty much wraps up his character and his character arc. I really don't think there was any reason to bring him back for the third film, but at the time they didn't know, or for some, or I guess for some reason they didn't know that Pinhead was the main draw of these films. So in the third film, they they try to come up with a way to bring him back, which the way they bring, kind of which the way they come up with to bring him back in the third film isn't so much a horrible way. It just seems kind of forced because this clearly feels like they were just they were trying to be done with the character here, but uh. 
but yeah, I, uh, this does feel like the end of the character of Pinhead, and he does feel a little forced coming back in the third film, despite the fact that in the third film, the way they bring him back is kind of neat, I think, or a decent idea. But uh, I would have liked it better if they didn't kill him off in this film and just kept him going. But at the time, uh, I mean, that way, so this film wouldn't feel so final for his character. But uh, at the time, they just didn't have no idea that Pinhead was like, you know, the shit in these films. And uh, even though I kind of feel like he does feel forced back into the third film and that this film kind of wraps up his character, um, I still don't think, even if the third film would have been really good, that it would have been as entertaining without him. So I can understand them wanting to bring him back. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Um, but uh, like I said, even if the third film would have been really good, uh, I would uh, it would have made more sense to me for the third film not to have had Pinhead in it. But, uh, I mean, story-wise, it would have made more sense. But at the same time, I don't think the third film would have been as good, even though I feel this film... <clears throat> sorry. Even though I feel this film wraps up his character arc perfectly well, um... I still don't think that the third film would have been half as entertaining, and apparently the st studios agreed uh, that fans probably would say, fuck this movie if Pinhead wasn't in it, which I would say most of them probably would, and, and to be honest, I probably would have been one of them, and probably would have took me a couple years to warm up to the third film, no matter how good it was. But as far as this film goes, just the idea of going into hell, and hell being like a giant fucking maze and everything, and learning more about Pinhead's past, and learning about who he was, and giving uh, Doug Bradley as Pinhead, like, some more to do in this film, um, is just really cool. One of my other only disappointments with this film is that Pinhead just gets killed off too quickly at the end. I like the idea that he realizes that he used to be human, and, uh, that's really neat, and I, but I don't like the fact that he gets killed off too quickly, and so that's what, uh, lowers this film, uh, the lowers this film, lowered, I mean, makes this film lower to me than the first film, makes me like the first film better, that and the, a little bit of weak script writing, because they had to rewrite it really quick, because Andrew Robinson said, fuck this, I ain't doing this for the money you're gonna pay me, but, uh, other than that, this film is extremely fun, and I just love the idea of, like, them going into hell and everything, it almost makes me wish I could see a remake of Hellraiser, just to see how cool the effects could be of hell and how cool the look of hell could look. But just knowing that would be CGI and a big clusterfuck. And if it doesn't have Doug Bradley in it, to be honest, it isn't, it isn't even worth doing. Now we're here with uh, the first Hellraiser film, which in my opinion is the best film of the entire Hellraiser franchise. I love this film. This film actually is more of a, a family drama, really a horrific family drama than it is like a, a fucking supernatural horror film. As a matter of fact, uh, it's kind of like the supernatural angle in the film is used as like the catalyst for like uh, the really epic, horrific family drama that we get in the film, which uh, I think this film plays Pinhead the right way. He's not in, he's not the main star of the film, which is the way I prefer it. But when he does show up in the film, you know, you get the idea, you know, don't fuck with this guy. And the scenes that he has in the film uh, are really impactful. And are definitely uh, the best scenes in the film. The Cenobites scenes in the film are the best in the film. And the coolest to look at. And just the design of Pinhead with all the nails in his head. Which he has nails in his head. So I'm surprised they don't really fucking call him Nailhead. But that kind of sounds stupid. Pinhead's more catchy. But uh, either way, uh, just the designs of the Cenobites. They all have really, really unique designs to them. Which, uh, starting with, Hell with Hellraiser 3, the Cenobite designs would go straight to hell. <laughs> literally. Because the designs of the Cenobites in 3 are utter shit. Just a little rant on that. Uh, just a little rant on those designs right there. But back to the first film. This is a really wonderful film. Uh, horror film wise. I love this film. Uh, it's got great family drama in it. With uh, Andrew Robinson in it. Playing Kirsty's dad. Uh, he's great at playing her dad. And at the end of it he's great at playing like. Uh, uh, playing the character of Frank. As if Frank's like. Uh, fucking like uh, wearing his skin. So he gets to play like a. Uh, Gets to play like a the evil, the evil Frank character as well, and he does really good uh, at playing both versions. Uh, I mean, I mean, he does really good at playing both characters, is what I'm trying to say. Um, not really any weak things about the film, really. The only weak thing I can kind of think of is that uh, at the end of the film, Kirsty kind of makes a deal with the Cenobites that they take Frank. I mean, that they can take Frank in her place, can take him to hell instead of her. And at the end of the film, they go back on their deal, which kind of makes them just look like kind of makes the Cenobites look like just traditional movie monsters who were just full of shit uh, and, and don't really honor their bargains and everything. And I kind of see the Cenobites as being more high class than that instead of just like regular movie monsters. 
But other than that, um, a few dated effects, like the wall crawler uh, in the film, that's uh, one little dated effect. Uh, that and um, and fucking uh, Kirsty's boyfriend in the film is completely useless and had no reason to be in this film at all. He is completely useless. But other than that, Ashley Lawrence's Kirsty is great in the film, and uh, she really helps carry the film, and you really feel for her for all the shit that she's going through. And the reason that this film uh, ranks really high for me on my faves is that the family drama in this film, I think, is just done so well um, that it just makes it uh, just makes it uh, kind of uh, more than just a horror movie about demons. Makes it, you know, a really horrific uh, uh, family drama. Really, more than a horror movie, but it's got enough horror in it to where it is, you know, a, a, a horrific uh, family drama. But all the elements balance together. Um, even if you would have took, what I really like about the film is that even if you would have took the supernatural part out and just made it more of a straight up family drama with the stuff that's there, I still think the film would have been interesting. But I do think by adding the horror element to it, the supernatural element, that's what elevates the film to even like more really cool family drama, horrific territory. It just makes it even that much more interesting to see, you know, this you know, these fucked up family secrets come to light in the film. Like with the character of of Julia, the stepmother, having slept with uh fucking the character Frank in the film, um, Kirsty's dad's uh, brother. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, the, all the actors do really fine in the film, and once again, yes, Doug Bradley as Pinhead steals the show, which makes me even more sick, and makes, I mean, makes me even, not, well, well, yeah, makes me even, like, even more sick to look at the film, uh, Hellraiser, I believe it's Revelations or something like that, or Hellraiser Shitstain, or whatever the fuck it's called, uh, the newest one, I'm not for sure, I forgot the title of it, but the one without Doug Bradley, um, it just makes me sick to look at it without him playing Pinhead after he's played the character like every single time up until then. Um, but yeah, as far as this film goes, I love this film. And you can definitely tell that Doug Bradley as the character of Pinhead has truly, uh, with this film, has truly cemented himself as a really terrific horror icon. Now here we are with the first Friday the 13th film. Um, I love this film. I'm not going to talk too much about this film because I've already done a review for it. Uh, but as far as this film goes, this is a wonderful film. Halloween is a better film than this, but this is the film that really kick-started the uh, slasher, slasher, genre, or slasher genre, I mean. It really kick-started it and spawned hundreds of imitators uh, and other films that tried to copy almost an exact similar style. But uh, as far as this film goes, uh, this is a great film. Just the idea, of, like Friday the Thirteenth, such a simple title, uh, but it just has uh, just has that you know Friday the Thirteenth association with it, just like that creepy bad luck day, you know, that kind of shit. And just with the title Friday the Thirteenth, you know, it's just like a simple title, just like you know the title Halloween. Uh, it's just catchy and uh, definitely gets you you know thinking hmm, maybe I should give this a watch. And this film I think is the best film in the Friday the Thirteenth franchise. It's a it's a really great film and I mean it was, I mean yeah it's a really great film it's a really great horror film. The only problems I have with it are little minor nitpicks. Um, the special effects in the film still hold up very strongly even for today. The effects by Tom Savini are terrific and Kevin like uh like uh Kevin Bacon getting speared from underneath the bed uh and fucking uh Betsy Palmer getting her head chopped off at the end of it. And once and Betsy Palmer in the film uh, as Jason's mom taking revenge for his death. It's, it's just terrific uh, as the killer with like uh, the way the the way she's like thinks she's communicating with her dead son and he's like speaking through her and she's like killer mommy killer just the just that whole acting idea I once again I don't know if she came up with that or if that was the director or whoever but whoever did that was fucking genius uh, but just the way she delivers it is absolutely awesome and the theme for this film just the <laughs> it's just fucking amazing just that theme is terrific. Uh, I love that. I love the theme for this film. Um, the score, yeah, the the theme by Harry Manfredini, I mean, is just utterly terrific. He does, he he came up with a great theme for this film. The only thing that really weakens this film, uh, for me, other than the little nitpicks, is that the mystery of who the killer is is pretty weak because no matter who you guess, you're gonna be wrong no matter what because the killer randomly shows up at the end of the film. Uh, and it's like none of the people that we've seen in the film. So you kind of get uh, ripped off on the mystery angle in the film. 
But other than that, uh, the kills in the film and the sus and the suspenseful final of the film with Betsy Palmer trying to fucking kill Alice at the end of the film, the character Alice, is just really entertaining. And just the decapitation at the end of the film uh, f firmly uh, solidifies this film in horror movie history. Stepping back into or stepping into vampire territory here with Fright Night. Uh, this is one of my favorite vampire films. I love this film. Uh, I get a real kick out of this film. I just like the idea of this film, kind of like a rear window type approach to it with the character Charlie in the film, like wondering if his fucking neighbor is a vampire. And uh, the character of the vampire in the film, played by Chris Sarandon. Uh, I like Chris Sarandon. I liked him in Child's Play. Once again, I like him again here. Uh, he he he's perfect as as the vampire. Uh, he's really good. Um, not really any complaints about this film, other than the uh, other than the fucking uh, like a uh, subplot or whatever. Yeah, the subplot of like uh, Charlie's girlfriend supposed to supposedly looking a lot like um, the vampire in the film, like looking like his old uh, his old flame from back in the day, or a woman that he used to be in love with. That's a little bit too much of a coincidence for me. Uh, other than that, um, and I think it wasn't fleshed out that well, other than that, there's not really anything that really is bad in this film, and I think this film carries itself really well, and I think it's really fun, and I really like the character of Evil Ed in the film, I think he's funnier than shit, uh, and I also like the practical effects in this film, once again, the practical effects look way better in this film than a lot of the really shit fuck -tastic CGI that we get today, um, <clears throat> I also uh, love the character of uh, Peter Vincent in the film, uh, who actually uh, ho hosts the show Fright Night that Charlie's a big fan of. Uh, the character of Peter Vincent is a lot of fun. Um, it's just I just find it really funny that Charlie goes to him trying to get help to defeat a vampire, when obviously Peter Vincent just plays on the show Fright Night and doesn't actually believe in vampires at all. Uh, that's, I just get a laugh out of that in the film, and I just think this like whole idea of this film is a really creative idea, and I, in my opinion, this is one of the best vampire films ever made. Um, and I really love the practical effects at the end of it when, uh, like when, well, well, the makeup effects. I mean, at the end of it, like when fucking Charlie's girlfriend turns into a vampire and the way her face looks is just awesome. It's like a really unique vampire design, and in my opinion, one of the best ones I've ever seen, and. Uh, it's still one of the best ones I've ever seen, even today. This is a truly great film with uh, a really uh, wonderful uh, 80s vibe to it that I also really love. Um, I really don't think this film ever needed to be remade, but the fact that it was, the remake was okay, but just couldn't recapture the magic or the same like flavor of this film. And the character of Evil Ed was completely wasted in the remake, I thought, despite the fact that he was casted with a with an actor that I really think was appropriate for that character. Um, I think Christopher Mintz Blast was really appropriate for that character, but I think he was completely wasted in the remake. Uh, so for me, I'll always take this uh, original film here, hands down, over the remake any day. Um, but yeah, the I would love uh, to see like a, a newer vampire film that could that could even come close to capturing the magic of this film and just the fun of this film, or just the fun, or just even like have fun characters like the ones in this film like Evil Ed. I would love to see a newer vampire film come close to that or the, or the things I've named off. But as far as from the looks of things now, all we're going to be getting is like shitty over stylized underworld films. Now we're here with The Frighteners which is my second favorite uh, Michael J. Fox film. Uh, I really love this film. The only kind of gripes I have about it is I think some of the comedy in it gets a little bit too silly. But I, I really love Jeffrey Combs' character in this film as well. I'm a big Jeffrey Combs fan as well. And he's funny as shit in this film as like the fucking uh, wacky FBI agent. Um, Michael J. Fox, he's great in the film. This is my second favorite Michael J. Fox film after Back to the Future. Um, I really enjoy this film. It's just got a lot of fun to it with the humor, with the ghosts and everything. And uh, it also has like some really intense moments, I think. Like the flashback scene of the massacre where the killer and his girlfriend are like wiping out all the fucking uh, old people. Um, I actually think, yeah, like I said, this film has some uh, genuine like uh, horror thrill moments to it. But it's more funny than it is anything, I think. Or, uh, well, it tries, to, it tries to balance both, but I think it winds up being maybe a little bit too much comedy in the film. I would, have, I would have preferred a little bit more horror. But as it is, this is a really entertaining film, and I highly recommend it. This is 
this is my favorite film that dealing with ghosts um, out of any I've ever seen. I get a like just a lot of joy watching this film and a lot of fun just with Michael J. Fox's performance as a guy who can like see ghosts and like uh, gets his two ghost buddies to pretend like they're haunting places. That way he can act like he comes in and saves the day. Just that whole setup idea and everything is extremely fun. And Michael J. Fox is an actor I wish would do more stuff today, but I know because of his sickness he doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't really work that. He doesn't really work anymore. But uh, he will always be for me. He will always be remembered for me as the guy. And uh, he will always be remembered to me as the the hero of uh, both this movie and Back to the Future. Here I am with Halloween. Now, this is another film that I've done a review for already, so I'm not going to get too in-depth with this review either. Uh, but just to give a quick little roundup of why this film is one of my faves. I love this film. Uh, this is, in my opinion, my uh, John Carpenter's best film. The suspense in the film is just unrivaled by almost any other film I've ever seen. I don't even, well, it is unrivaled by any other film I've ever seen. And I don't think it's this I don't I don't think the suspense in this film has ever been equaled by any other film. And just like the character of Michael Myers just has such a spookiness to him in this film that would be completely lost in the later sequels when they made him into just like a, a Jason clone. But for this film the character of Michael Myers and uh well the shape if you prefer to call him and uh, just like the whole urban legend style vibe of it, him like stalking the babysitter played by Jamie, uh, well stalking babysitters. Um, of course the main babysitter played by Jamie Lee Curtis um, just adds such an extra element to this film. And obviously the film taking place on Halloween just has like, it's just an, an obvious wonderful setting for a film like this. A wonderful time to set the film I mean. Just this film just hits everything right. It's spooky when it needs to be. It's creepy when it needs to be. Michael Myers is extremely mysterious. You don't really know is he human or is he not. And the film ends just in a way where I really don't think the film ever needed any sequels. Uh, it just ends in like a perfect urban legend kind of way. Like when Michael Myers falling off the balcony and just never seen again. Would have, would have been the way I would have preferred the film to end. Like just with a little uh, monologue at the end of it. Or just with the words popping up on the screen saying he was never apprehended. Um, and he was never seen again. I would have preferred that as the ending for this film. Uh, that way, <laughs> hopefully there wouldn't have been any sequels. But there would have been anyway regardless. Just, to, because, just because of how much money this film made. But just because, but, but because of the urban legend vibe of this film and the mysterious, uh, mysteriousness of the shape, who is just kept in shadow like so well in this film, um, I can't, I just can't uh, talk enough about the excellent suspense in this film and the wonderful Donald Pleasance as the Michael Myers uh, hunter in the film. This film just hits it right on every level. This will always, for me, be one of the greatest slasher films. Well, if not the greatest slasher film in the history of slasher films. Well, in my opinion, it is the greatest slasher film. And I know in most people's opinion it is as well. It is as well but I just can't stress enough that if you haven't seen this film, uh, you should definitely check this film out. And if you have seen this film, like me, I'm sure you watch it every Halloween. Just to jump straight into the next film here, I have From Dust Till Dawn, which has always been one of my favorite vampire films. Uh, I just get a get a fun time out of watching this film. I will be honest, the first half of the film, the crime thriller part of the film, is much more tense and much and much more better done and written than the second half of the film when they're at the bar and it becomes like an over the top vampire B film. Um, but uh, still, the vampire over the top part is extremely fun. And I just really like the idea of a, of a movie starting out as one thing and becoming another. That's just all, that's just a really fun idea to me. Um, as far as the film goes, I love George Clooney in this film. He kicks ass and he comes off as a real like hard ass but a badass at the same time. Uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino, I think this is it. He's never been a great actor, but this is the best acting I've ever seen him do. Um, Harvey Keitel is great in the film. Uh, all the actors do fine. I also love fucking... Um, Tom Savini in this film as the character Sex Machine with his cock gun. That just cracks me up. As far as other, th other things go in the film, you got Selma Hayek in the film doing her famous lap dance, which I'm sure every guy on the planet knows about by now. But other than that, um, you get uh, really fun stuff with the vampires and really like funny, uh, funny comedy like with the vampires. 
Um, you got like a uh, fucking Cheech, like a uh, Cheech Marin who plays like three different characters in this film. Who's like standing outside and uh like in front of the bar, and he keeps talking about all the different flavors of pussy they got in the bar. And that right there just cracks me up. They just hit like his his uh <laughs> whole like uh his entire speech he goes on about it is just hilarious. Um, Rob Rodriguez directs this film. I like Rob Rodriguez. He brings a good style to this film. Lately, his films I think have been lacking. I recently saw Machete Kills, and I didn't think it was anything to write home about. It was pretty bad in my opinion. But just to focus on this film, this is a really fun film. Uh, the second half is the weaker half. So not all the comedy works. Like uh, like uh, the one guy gets turned into a vampire, and Harvey Keitel is like uh, pulls his shotgun out of his stomach and gets ready to and just like uh, just raises it up to hit him with it, and then like scares him to death, and he like evaporates. That was a little stupid. Uh, one or two little weak effect shots, but for the most part, the effects are really good in the film. And this film is just really fun. Uh, in my opinion, just like uh, the whole idea of like <laughs> fucking George Clooney of all people and a group of like over the top characters uh, being stuck in uh, a bar having to survive the night uh, to get a and, and uh, to kill all the vampires. It's just extremely fun. You get Tom Savini in here in a really hilarious scene where a vampire grabs him and his like this fucking crotch gun pops out and sh shoots him. Uh, it's hilarious. Uh, this is the first time they used the crotch gun. Rob Rodriguez would use overuse this gun like over and over in other things, and the joke kind of ran its course. He uses it once again in Machete Kills, and I'm like, for fuck's sake, man, come up with some new material. But anyway, just as far as this film goes, this film is just a lot of fun. I, a lot of the characters are like really colorful and over the top in the second half. The characters in the bar are, and they're just really fun to watch. Not really any complaints about the film. Um, all the actors do fine. The weakest actor is probably the probably the kid is, that plays the uh, that plays uh, Juliet Lewis's brother in the film. Uh, he's the weakest uh, link of the of the film. But other than him, everybody else pretty much brings their A game. But he's the weakest. He's the weakest uh, acting wise and the weakest character. He's the most uninteresting. But everybody else pretty much brings their A game, and they're just a lot of fun to watch. Uh, it's especially like uh, it's especially uh, fun for me just to watch like George Clooney's performance. He just fucking cracks me up in this film, and his like uh, back and forth with Harvey Keitel. I mean, not Harvey Keitel, but Quentin Tarantino. Their characters are playing; they're playing brothers, uh, and just their back and forth between those two characters is just uh, really fun for me. Just the dialogue they have, and how like uh, obviously Quentin Tarantino is like his brother's like fucked in the head. George Clooney's uh, character's brother is in the film. Uh, <laughs> But he still takes up for him and everything, even though he clearly knows that his brother is fucked in the head. But yeah, this is a really entertaining vampire film. I highly recommend this film. I definitely recommend that people check it out. If you're a fan of crime thrillers, I'd say check it out. But uh, uh, make sure you don't look up any inf any information about... I mean, like, if you got a friend or somebody who's not seen this film, make sure you... Well, like I was saying, if you're a fan of crime thrillers, you should check this film out. And if you're a fan of vampire films, you should check this film out. Because you're getting like, you know, two for the price of one. But uh, if you have a friend who's never seen this movie, don't tell him uh, that it's actually a vampire film. And let him watch it and watch the fucking look on his face when it actually turns into a vampire. I like it. I mean, when it actually turns into an over-the-top vampire film and in the second act. The next on the list is the remake of The Hills Have Eyes, which is one of the only remakes that I actually enjoy. Uh, I really enjoy this film. Uh, it's pretty close to the original but with some slight differences, but the climax of the film and uh, the revenge of the of the family is is a lot different than the revenge of the original film. I thought actually thought the revenge of the original film was a little weak. Uh, I think it's improved upon here but with the character of Doug, and he just, uh, I like the character of Doug, I mean, better in this version than the original version. And yes, I do enjoy this film more than the original. Uh, the character of Doug, like, whoops fucking ass and has some, uh, way cooler badass fights in this version of the, of the story than he did in the original film. And I just root for the actor more in, the actor who plays Doug in this film more than the actor in the original. I feel like the actor in this film has more charisma. Uh, and I just, I don't know, he just had something about him that I just liked him better. Uh, but, um, you get a really cool fight scene uh, between him and this, uh, in one of the Hills Have Eyes guys. Um, uh, it's, uh, he's like, he, he thinks that he gets, well, he gets his fingers chopped off and they think he's like begging for his life, but he like fucking jabs a, like a flag, uh, American flag 
like into into the guy and then like hacks him in the back of the fucking head. It's really awesome and really cool. And uh, the film's pretty close to the original up until like uh, that point when the he goes to like get his baby and then it becomes like the him getting him paying the the fucking uh, mutants back. In the original film, I think they were just cannibals. In this film, they're actually uh, people who are slightly mutated by like uh, because their area was used for bomb testing, I believe. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit more theatrical than the original film. But uh, it it's, they doesn't do it in an over the top way. I mean, they don't like have superpowers or anything. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is a really good film. And once again, the revenge uh, of by the character Doug. His revenge, I think, is much more enjoyable in this film than it was in the original film. And, of course, the makeup effects uh, on the the mutants the, or the Hills Have Eyes people I th are really good in this film. The effects are really good. Um, it's just, uh, this film is just more enjoyable for me to watch than the original film. I also like the ending of this film better than the original film. The only thing I really don't like about this film is that it sets up for a sequel for one tiny little sequence at the end where it's got like somebody watching them at the end. Um, I mean, I don't hate that little bit, but it doesn't really need it because the sequel we did get uh, sucks uh, the cock pretty hard. The sequel to this movie is utter shit, and I recommend that if you do like this movie as much as I did or like it at all, then do yourself a favor and stay as far away as you can from the sequel to this film because it is truly an abomination. So here we are with The Hitcher, which is uh, which would also be one of my, if this list was in order, this would also be in my top 10 favorite horror films of all time. I love this film, uh, in my opinion, <coughs> sorry, uh, in my opinion, uh, this is a run of Rucker Howard's greatest performances. I love this film. Um, just like the idea of it, of just being out on the road by yourself one night, and just getting picked and just picking up a hitchhiker <laughs> and uh, just having that person turn out to be crazy is just like a really creepy idea to me. And just the way the movie's played with like Rucker Hauer constantly fucking with C. Thomas Howell over and over in this film is just so entertaining. And this film's like not a, not afraid to pull punches like uh, the, the obvious like uh, love interest in the film, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee. But she, uh, she's the obvious love interest in the film, but she's never really treated like a love interest. Like her and C. Thomas Howell never really develop like a romantic relationship. But they never get to the point where they actually sleep together in the film, which I'm glad because it would have seemed really silly for them to sleep together in the midst of like all this like fucking chaos going on. But uh, she ends up getting ripped in half uh, by Rucker Hauer. Uh, she's tied between two uh, coal trucks. Um, that right there alone is just uh, incredibly cool. Or she's tied to a truck. I mean, that right there is just incredibly cool right there. The fact that uh, they're not afraid to pull punches and actually kill off one of the main characters. And all through the movie, you don't even know really, you don't even really know why that uh, Rucker Howard is like torturing C. Thomas Howell through the entire film. You just The movie just kind of like gives you like a, a little bit of an idea that he's like, kind of like he's trying to get C. Thomas Howell to man up and kill him. But you never know why. Uh, and you never know who the hitcher is, so it leaves it as a mystery. And any film that can develop a terrific mystery and leave uh, and have the film end with not a lot of questions answered, but still be highly entertaining and have that not aggravate you at the same time, in my opinion, is a truly great film. Ah, Gremlins. Now this isn't just one of my favorite horror films, but this is also one of my fucking favorite holiday films. I love watching this film on Christmas. This film makes my list because it's a terrific uh, horror film, uh, horror, uh, it's a terrific, horrific version of a child's fantasy gone wrong, I would say is what it is. I love how the film starts out and you think it's going to be like some kind of cute little child's uh, children's film, not once it just fucking transforms into a movie about these little crazy looking little sons of, sons of bitches who are like fucking terrorizing the town. This film is highly entertaining, I love this film. This film stars Zach Galligan, who uh, is good in the film. As the character of Billy who owns Gizmo in the film. Uh, also the film also stars uh, uh, Phoebe Katz. I think is her name. As the character Kate. The, I know it's the woman from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. She is incredibly hot. And she is still incredibly hot in this film. But uh, <laughs> other than her hotness. This film also has Judge Reinhold. Um, also has Judge Ryan Hold, and he plays an asshole in the film. Uh, he just fucking disappears. He doesn't really get a comeuppance. I know it explains it in a deleted scene, 
but still, I kind of wish that would have been in the film. Uh, Phoebe Katz, or I guess it's Phoebe Cates, is how you say her name. She gets the best, uh, she gets the best, uh, the high log scene in the entire film where she gives like a big monologue about why she doesn't like Christmas. And it starts out like, it's kind of like really silly, but it's kind of like really sad at the same time. You'll have to watch the movie to understand, you'd have to have seen the movie to understand what I'm saying. Which I'm sure if you're watching this video, you probably have seen the movie. But that right there, that, that speech that she gives, uh, is just the, the greatest, uh, set of lines. This, that's just the greatest, like, this fucking, uh, speech in any film. I've just about ever heard. I love that speech. It's so sad yet <laughs> fucking hilarious at the same time. It just perfectly sums up the movie. Um, but yeah, this film, what I love about it is it's able to switch tones, and it switches tones like so good, like effortlessly, that you just, uh, you don't even really like, uh, I don't think audiences today really even know that back in the day this film was one of the films responsible for the PG-13 rating, because today it just flows so good. From one style to the next, that you really don't even notice it. And the original script was even much darker than the movie we ended up with, like with the gremlins cutting the mom's head off and her fucking head rolling down the stairs. Now, if we'd have got that film, uh, <laughs> I could only imagine at the backlash from parent groups. But yeah, as far as this film goes, it's a terrific film with wonderful, wonderful, wonderful special effects, practical special effects for the gremlins. Um, I've heard about a remake of this film, and I hope, I really hope that it never happens. I hope to God it never happens, because if it does, we're going to be looking at some really fucking shitty, horrible CGI gremlins. Now, just to, just to end this little section here for gremlins, Gizmo Kaka!